All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, by the attendance, I can see uh, there are a lot of circuit designers in the room. Uh, uh, but um, anyway, so let's get, let's get uh, moving forward and talk about fault injection detection. So we're going to talk about some fault in injection detection basics. Uh, we're going to dive into the tunable replica circuit itself. We're going to talk about how Intel integrated the TRC, a little bit about calibration and validation, and some conclusions. Uh, a little bit, little bit about myself. I've been with uh, Intel for a long, long time, working on such products as the manageability engine and the convert security manageability engine since their inceptions. Uh, Carlos Tokunaga is on uh, the phone. He's been a circuit designer and architect in Intel Labs for also a very long time. Um, so let's get started. I tend to ask questions to the audience, so pay attention. Uh, and I'm hoping you guys are going to learn something here. The focus is to explain to you all what Intel is doing for fault injection detection uh, and a little bit about the technology itself. OK, so some of the basics. So focusing on non-invasive fault injection attacks um, where modification of the package is out of scope is really the, um, the gist of the presentation. So um, uh, some of the attacks, when we refer to non-invasive fault injection, what we're saying is, you can attack uh, and anything around the package, the motherboard, the bumps, the pins, et cetera. But once you start cracking the package open, that's out of scope for these types of, these types of attacks. And so when we talk about non-invasive fault injection, we're talking about voltage attacks. Uh, we're talking about clock attacks. Uh, we're talking about electromagnetic radiation attacks, otherwise known as EMFI. And then finally, uh, we're talking about thermal attacks. And so all these attacks are unique in that you can, you can mount them on silicon without touching anything inside the package itself. So once you crack the package open, it's a different type of attack. And, um, but uh, once again, non really, for, again, for non-invasive fault injection, we're talking about pin modification for the most part. And the primary pins that we're talking about here are both digital and analog voltage rails as well as on our parts, we have two inputs from crystals, uh, our 32.7 kilohertz uh, crystal and our 38.4 megahertz crystal. So these are really the primary attack surfaces for non-invasive fault injection and the primary focus of this talk. Um, when we get to semi-invasive, really the primary attack vector is lasers um, because for the most part, they require a package D-lib, right? Now there has been some research done where you could avoid a package D-lid and shoot a laser from the side, um, but that research is, is pretty uh, new. So for the majority of, of laser-based attacks, you know, you do require a D-lid. Um, so now to complete the circle, uh, so again, laser attacks are also out of scope uh, because the tunable replica circuit isn't, we're not, uh, we're not making any promises that it will detect a laser attack. Uh, so completing the circle is we have, um, we have highly invasive fault injection attacks. And these attacks are completely out of scope. Now I'll give you guys three guesses at what slide I had to spend the most time with the lawyers on. All right, yeah, exactly, this one. OK, um, so what is uh, an attacker trying to accomplish with fault injection? And really what they're trying to do is to get circuit timing to fail without causing the whole platform to crash. Because if they do a fault injection attack using voltage or clock, EMFI, or, or heat, and the platform just crashes, then there's no point, right? So they really want to get to the point where they can cause circuit timing to fail, but the platform maintains, or the, the target of evaluation, uh, the entity under attack doesn't completely crash, right? And so why is circuit timing interesting? Well, circuit timing is interesting because when circuit timing fails, you can get data to be latched either too early or too late. Now, in this presentation, we're going to focus on latching data too early because that is, a, that is a, in the scope of undervoltage attacks. Uh, we could talk about uh, latching data too late. It would just take too much time. But the same principles apply. So um, now, when you, if you latch data too early in many platforms or microcontrollers, what's happening is you're latching zeros, OK? And so first question for the audience is, what instruction is mostly associated with a value of zero? Anybody know? Yeah, no op, exactly, right. And so the kind of holy grail 
of a fault injection attack is if you can convert a jump to a no-op when authenticating trusted firmware in a secure engine, right? So, um, so at just the right time after uh, an attacker slaps their malicious firmware inside a flash device or some other device or loads it into the uh, memory of a controller, it's going to fail authentication, but the jump to error, if they can cause that jump to error to be a no-op, it'll fall through and execute the main image of their malicious firmware. So that's kind of the holy grail here. So converting a jump to a no-op is really what, at a simple level, an attacker is trying to do with a fault injection attack. Okay, and so how does this apply to timing? Well, in a standard timing diagram, you might have something, again, this is very simplified, but I, I'm trying to uh, hone in on some key points here. So as you can see, uh, on the second rising edge of this clock, when you have data running at nominal voltage, the jump is latched, right? And so, but, as, as, as some of you may know, once you drop the voltage of the data lines, the data moves faster or slower? Slower, good, okay. So if you can get the data to move slower, you push those data lines out to the right, and the clock isn't changing, presumably, uh, on this simple attack, and so you're latching a jump. And, uh, sorry, you're latching a no-op instead of a jump, and you've succeeded in executing malicious code. Okay, this is kind of important. So this is really what the attacker is trying to do. Now, if we take clock glitching, it's very similar. So you have the same good clock and data executing, um, and data, ex data uh, being driven at nominal voltage. So what would the clock look like if they glitched it to a faster clock? Anybody know? Be a little louder, I can't hear. Uh, well, so, okay, so the clock would shift over and the clock cycle itself would be much smaller, right? Right there. And so, in effect, the clock is latch, the clock's rising edge is, the second rising edge of the clock is much earlier, again, latching a no up because you sped up that clock. Now, how fast do you want to speed up the clock and how, and how fast do you want to drive the voltage? So you, you don't want to drive that voltage low for a second, because if you drop it low for a second at that low of a voltage, it's going to crash the whole platform. And so what an attacker is trying to do, ideally, is drive the voltage to a very low value for roughly a clock cycle. So in a 100 megahertz processor, they're trying to drive that voltage uh, to a very low voltage for roughly 10 nanoseconds, and they're trying to convert a 10 nan, or in a clock attack, they're trying to, in one clock cycle, change the clock cycle from a 10 to, let's say, a 5 nanosecond clock cycle. If they can do that precisely, they've got a very good system for mounting an attack. Okay, so what do we do to solve this problem? Well, as you may have gathered, we're focused a little bit more on circuit timing than we are on actual voltage or clock frequencies, and so that's kind of what's unique and special here. Okay, so the tunable replica circuit, which Carlos on the phone and his team actually invented way back when to mitigate, a they invented it to mitigate aging in silicon. Because when silicon ages, its timing starts to fail. As they all get older, we start slowing down, right? And circuits are no different. And so by detecting when circuit timing started to slow down, Carlos and the team could actually uh, reduce guard banding and, and, and add more, and essentially yield more die for Intel. And so that technology was named the tunable replica circuit. Now since, as we've just discussed, fault injection behaves the same way through, a, through bad timing, if the TRC can detect when timing fails in a circuit, it can detect voltage and clock and EMFI and thermal attacks. And so what the TRC is, is it's a very simple circuit. Uh, again, this is the most complicated circuit diagram, and it might be an eye chart, but I'm going to get a little bit simpler, and we're going to dive into it with a simpler, more concise diagram. But what it consists of is a launch flop, a tunable delay chain, and a capture flop. Now, this capture flop here is really determining if a data line that's being driven along the delay line is coming in too slow versus what we call a reference signal. And you'll see this in, a, in, in the next diagram. So don't worry, this isn't the only diagram you're going to see. We're going to dive in. And the key element 
is the delay line. And it's the delay line that's tuned to match worst case nominal timings in our product, right? So it's supposed, so that delay line should match what the worst case delays are and still work, right? And once you fall below that, our, our product won't functionally work and meet timing. And that point, uh, it can only be in the tack, we've determined. So we're going to jump ahead and dive a little bit deeper and make things a little bit simpler. So a slightly more sim a simplified uh, diagram here. So you've got some key signals. One is a clock, one is a reference line, and one is a data actual line that is calibrated uh, to match the timing of the circuit at a worst case level. And then you've got the launch and the capture flop. So the input clock that's coming in will actually, on the rising edge, launch the signal along the data reference line and the data actual line. And the second rising edge, it will capture whether those two lines are the same or different. And there's an, as you can see, you have the XOR gate that is, that is inputting those two data lines. And as we know, with an XOR, if, it, if two signals are the same, you get a zero. If the signals are different, you get a one. And so on the second rising edge of the clock, if the, if the data reference line and the data actual line are not the same, you will generate, you will latch a one and output an error. In other words, you've determined that timing has failed. Okay, so how does this work uh, looking at these two lines? Now the data reference line, you can see, it's slightly coming, rising uh, after the input clock because the launch flop has a slightly smaller, has a slight propagation delay over nothing, right? Now what is really pushed out to the right is the data actual line due to that delay. So all those, uh, all those inverters and, uh, and NOR gates are causing that data line to move slower, okay? Now at that point in time, going through, now again, this, this data actual line is not under attack. It's a nominal line that we've calibrated to come up uh, at this very time. So this is, these are a couple easy questions. So in nominal cases, what is going to be the value of the XOR and slash the error on this line? Zero. Good. I know. This is <laughs> just to make sure you guys are paying attention. Right. So let's say we have an attack. And that, date, and that data line, that data actual line is moved over even to the right a little bit. This is, right, at which point, now that's because, again, lower voltage equals a slower data line. Okay, so at which point, what again now is the XOR result? One. Excellent. Good. So it now is detecting that data has moved too far to the right and is an error, it's failing timing, and it's been calibrated at this point that the only way it's moved this far is an attack. How far? That's kind of an important concept. Okay? All right. So uh, moving right along. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not sure those are, we'll take questions at the end if, if that was a question, I wasn't, I wasn't sure. So, okay, so why and how uh, did Intel integrate the TRC? So, um, so we integrated the TRC into CSME, which is an embedded, an embedded subsystem in the PCH, or the Platform Component Hub, of our client platform. It stands for Converged Security Man Manageability Engine. Uh, it's a standalone subsystem running inside what most people refer to as the South Bridge, and it has quite a few secure, high security applications in it. Uh, you may have heard of uh, this morning there was a talk on Boot Guard, on BIOS Guard. It's the root of trust for Boot Guard. Uh, it's the root of trust for uh, many applications like our integrated TPM. It's the root of trust for our manageability solution. So if an attacker was able to run, and it normally executes, it executes Intel signed firmware. So if an attacker was able to, uh, if an attacker was able to load their own firmware, they could essentially root the platform and bad things can happen. And there have been presentations at Black Hat where we have been attacked successfully through uh, software means, physical means, uh, non uh, physical means such as reflashing the part, uh, et cetera, and, and so that's a very, so having malware execute on CSME is pretty much a worst case scenario for Intel. And so we, we are doing everything possible to mitigate that, and now we're mitigating it through 
uh, fault injection detection as well. Okay. So where and how did we integrate this tunable repli replica circuit into CSME? So CSME is made up of three partitions. As you can see here, there's a x86, uh, sometimes called the minute IA microcontroller. There's a system agent, uh, and there's our IO devices uh, gasket. And so we integrated the TRC into the system agent, and in into the TRC we fed the same power line and the same clock line that are coming into CSME. Now, as you can see from this diagram, there's no direct way for f using a non-invasive means to glitch the CSME clock, because it's coming out of a PLL. So for a attacker to glitch the CSME clock, they, they can essentially, they have to use some pretty sophisticated mechanisms by glitching the crystal itself. However, the voltage rail directly coming into the package and powering the majority of the circuitry inside the PCH is also powering CSME. And so by placing a TRC on VNN inside CSME, it essentially can attack, it will detect an attack on any of the CSME partitions. And even more than that, theoretically, although we're not making any promises about this, it would detect, it would, the same attack would apply to any of the other devices or IPs inside the PCH. Now, we don't make claims about that because CSME is often power gated, and if CSME is power gated, so is the TRC. So we don't really make any claims about, for example, uh, the, CSM, the, the TRC protecting the USB controller or some other controller. Um, however, it is, we do make a claim that the TRC will protect CSME against all voltage and clock attacks, as well as, as thermal and uh, EMFI. Um, okay, so there's no specific reason we placed it in the system agent. It was, well, the, the reason we placed it in the system agent is because it was easiest to invoke our countermeasures. So once the TRC detects an error, it outputs a signal, and from that point, we isolate CSME and take it through reset, right? So the result of a, um, of a glitch attack is CSME goes into reset. Uh, the platform does not reset. We got specific marching orders from our client team. We didn't want to just reset the uh, end user's platform, at least initially. And so if you're attacking CSME uh, and CSME goes to reset, essentially all the CSME services will fail safe. Right? That's, um, that's really what, what the TRC's goal is initially. Now, initially, in addition to that, we have calibration logic. We have fuses that we have to pull, and we'll get into that uh, details in just a second. Okay, so why do we choose to integrate the TRC? Um, physical attacks are getting cheaper to mount. These voltage and clock glitches you can just buy, right, directly from various companies, um, or you can rent them. Uh, Intel views security as an evolutionary concept, and every year we're seeking to add more, one or two significant features to improve the security of CSME, and the TRC is just an, a good example of, those roadmap, of this roadmap. Um, like I mentioned before, CSME has integrated a TCG compliant TPM 2.0 device. Uh, I kind of, that's near and dear to my heart because I was actually responsible for that for some years. And as some of you may know, uh, TPMs, especially discrete TPMs, have requirements to protect against physical attacks. So it's one of our goals to make the integrated TPM for CSME as close to discrete TPM and robustness as possible. And, uh, and we believe that with the TRC, we have, without question, uh, a best-in-class uh, TPM inside the PCH. Um, so anyway, I just mentioned that. Okay. So getting to uh, validation and calibration. Okay, so what are some of the key principles of calibrating this? And we're going to go back to stuff we talked about. So if you incorrectly calibrate the TRC, you can have false positives and, or you can misdetect an attack. Typically, both won't happen. It's, it's a very, very bad thing if we had a false positive. Um, under knowing that, that by, by far is, is critical. So, if, if a false positive occurred, really, really bad things, such as product replacements, et cetera, might happen. So without question, we, we, do not, we, we are very, very concerned with false positives. And obviously, we want to avoid any chance of missing an attack as well. And if you calibrate this thing incorrectly, one of the two will happen. Um, so how does calibration work? 
Well, it starts from the concept that given a circuit at a fixed frequency, we know when the circuit timing will fail. Right? We just know that inherently as circuit designers. I'm not a circuit designer, but, but Carlos is. And so we have called that point where, circuit, where the circuit timing will fail V glitch. And that's at a point that only could be a result of an attack. There are normal voltage droops that you see uh, when you're running high workloads. Let's say you're, you know, let's say you're copying, uh, you're ripping a DVD and, 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 and sending it out on the network or something from a serial ATA drive on your network. So you're going to see voltage droops due to those high workloads. And so there are normal legal, what we'll call it legal or kosher droops that occur in, in the wild. And we don't want a false positive to occur as a result of those droops. We want a, an, an attack to be detected only as a result of a glitch that we know could only be caused as a result of an attacker. Okay, now this value, so hypothetically let's say, and I'm not going to give you real numbers because I'll tell you everything I can, but, but very process specific stuff I'm not going to tell you. Um, so let's say hypothetically nominal voltage is one volt. You might see a V glitch of let's say 750 millivolts, right? Um, and so the only way to get from one, to se one volt to 750 millivolts is through an attack. And, we, and, when we, and when we're measuring the 750 millivolts, we're measuring it at CSME. We're not measuring it at the pin, right? Because between what you see at the pin and what you see at CSME is, is totally different, or any other integrated, any, any other highly integrated device because of various levels of circuits and buffers and isolation, et cetera. So, so you have to drive a very, very low voltage value, typically in the negative voltage on the pin to see a droop to let's say from a 250 millivolt droop at the device itself. And this V glitch again is global. So all the hundreds of millions of parts that we ship in a, for a given product, V glitch will be the same for all those parts. So there's, and I'm mentioning this because there are very part specific pieces to calibration and then there's global pieces to calibration. So calibrating each TRC is done independently. So each one is uniquely calibrated on our manu manufacturing line. Um, now, I don't, they're not uniquely, because everyone doesn't have a unique value, but they're independently calibrated. And they're done, and, and what calibration really is, is taking that V glitch value, which is a droop, let's say, I just mentioned of hypothetically 250 millivolts, and converting it to delays, right? So what's the, what is the data path speed at one volt versus the data path speed at 750 millivolts for that sp each specific part, and it's different for every part. Okay, so that, and then we fuse that delay value into silicon, and that fusing blows in that, the right number of, of, of inverters and NOR gates in the TRC itself. Okay, so we're gonna jump back to the TRC uh, uh, schematic and waveforms and talk a little bit more about this. So here we go to our favorite diagram. In this picture, again, we have a, a TRC calibrated running at nominal voltage, not generating an error. Okay. So, on this timing diagram, what is the delay corresponding to V glitch? And I'll give you a hint. It's the distance between two rising edges. So, anybody, whether to, uh, anybody want to guess which two rising edges is corresponding to the delay at V glitch? Exactly. Good. If I had, if I had, I forgot my candy, and if I had it, I would have given you candy. Yeah. So that point there is a value in picoseconds, right, that we need to fuse into each, into every part. Okay. So here is something very important. What happens if we increase that delay, right? What happens is, uh, well, so let's say, let's, let's change that. If that, if the delay value was zero, if we didn't fuse any gates, that TRC data actual would be the exact same as TRC data ref. And it, would be, and, and it would be impossible to detect an attack at that point because no matter how much they glitched, and no matter how much they slowed down the, TR, the data actual, it would never get far enough to, to detect an attack. Conversely, if we blew in too many of those gates, at nominal volt, that, 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 uh, that rising and lowering edge of actual would move over so far to the right at nominal voltage, when you flipped on the machine, it would detect an attack, as, and that's obviously a false positive. 
So the danger in, in calibrating it with too long of a delay is that you get a false positive due to either nominal voltage. That's not so bad. We detect that right away, right? But worse is a rare droop that occurs because somebody is running some workload that we didn't think of, okay? So that delay, making it just the right length, is done on each part and is the mainstay of calibration, okay? So how do we find the per part glitch? So we use high school math, right, to essentially generate a slope that mimics, that is, that is actually, that, that will allow us to, that, that, that shows us the voltage delay curve. Again, this is important, that's common to all parts. Okay, so all parts have, uh, we, we calculate a slope where on the y-axis you have delay and on the x-axis you have voltage. So for any given part, you would just go and find a voltage and get that right delay for that part, okay? And what the TR, so in manu, so we calculate this using a whole bunch of data, what this slope is. All right, y equals mx plus b, All right? Pretty big, if you guys remember high school math. So now what the TRC does in manufacturing is it's running at, in manufacturing at nominal voltage. And at nominal voltage, the TRC will spit out what delay is causing, well, is, what the delay is at nominal voltage. It will just report that to us, okay? It just through, through a, through, we have a, an internal finite state machine that just calculates what the delay is in nominal voltage. Um, and so with that information, right, what we can, using the slope, again, y equals mx plus b, we can go and find the point in time, we can reduce it down to v glitch. So if you know the slope, you know v nom, right, and you know v, and therefore you get no v nom delay, it's v, and then you know v glitch because it's global, using two points on a, on a line that you, on a line equation that you already know, it's very easy to calculate what the delay at V glitch is. And we do this for every single part. So again, what's, uh, what is global is the slope, the, the slope equation. Um, v glitch is global. What is unique per, V nom is known, right? We know that, it's a, it's a volt. Um, and the part, what is unique to the part, it's spitting out the delay at VNOM, which it spits out to us, and the delay at V glitch. Now, you may ask, well, why can't the part just spit out, why do you need this slope thing? Why can't you just run the part at V glitch and have it spit out the delay? Well, you, you, can't, you can't run at V glitch for more than a few nanoseconds or the whole machine dies, right? So, and our testers can't generate values that low. So you actually, it would be great. It would be really easy to calibrate these parts if they would run at V-Glitch, but the whole purpose of, of it is they don't run at V-Glitch, right? So that's why we have to use this uh, slope-based calculation uh, to, um, to calculate V-Glitch per part, or V-Glitch delay per part, okay? Um, okay, so then we do some testing, right? So how do we make sure this is the right, what we call recipe? Well, we run initially false positive testing. We put the part under high workloads to make sure it's not generating any false positives. But then we start glitching it, right? And so we essentially drive, multi we drive different voltages, uh, a matrix of voltages and, and, and pulse widths, something like this. So we generate, you know, at, at a given glitch length of, you know, of, of 10, 20, 30, 40 nanoseconds, we drive a, a hundred different voltages. And we do that for all various glitch lengths and various voltages. Now what's really, and, and what we see is we, we see areas in green where nothing fails, just fine. Then we get areas in kind of that beige or yellow where the, pla the whole platform crashed, right? So it was either running at a voltage for too long um, or too low of a voltage, and the platform just completely crashed and died. What is really critical is this red band of lines, and that is where the TRC detects an error, right? But the platform, right before the platform crashes, or if the platform might not crash. And so it's uber critical for us at every horizontal line, right, for us to detect um, a, a, for the TRC to detect an attack. Because if it doesn't, as you can see in one, uh, the third horizontal row from the bottom, 
then we essentially have a hole in the TRC where somebody could, um, could successfully glitch us and we wouldn't detect it. Okay, that's what this means. So let's see you. I think I already said all this stuff. <laughs> um, so in our first pass of testing on this product, which is the Intel 12th generation CPU, uh, core CPU, otherwise known as Alder Lake, we saw this that we had missed, uh, the TRC calibration. Okay. Um, and so, um, I'm, yeah, I'm running a little faster than I thought, but that's okay. More time for questions. So what happened? So with the initial batch of TRC, so what we do is we fuse roughly 100 parts. We run them through what we call false positive testing and glitch detection. And if any of them fail like they did, we, de we determine why. And what we determined was that we actually had set vglitch too low. So instead of uh, 750 millivolts, it really should have been, seven, let's say, 780, 775 millivolts, right? And we, and with that information, we modify the value of V glitch to what we determine should be the right value. Uh, and we, then we fuse another 100 parts, take them through false positive testing, take them through fault injection testing, and make sure they all pass. And once they do, and they did, and at this point, we didn't record any failures, and we also didn't record any false positives. And based on this data, we locked in the recipe for this 12th generation Alder Lake CPU, and it's shipping uh, in the desktop and mobile configuration right now. Um, so, um, so some some more so some more points about the TRC uh, I want to make is that because I've got some time, is that. Uh, why did we choose the TRC, right? So TPMs, smart cards, have been shipping with analog clock and voltage level detectors for almost 20 years now. So why didn't we just follow that model? Uh, so there's a couple things we like about the TRC. One is that with one circuit, we can detect all four attacks. That's one. Number two is that the TRC is a purely digital circuit using standard cells which means it's very easy to port, right? So we ha so it's not a soft IP, it's a hard IP, but it can, but it takes a very, very short amount of effort to port it to a new process. And we typically change processes, well, <laughs> less often than we'd like, but we change them as often as we can, and we want to make that, that effort, we want to make it very easy for us to switch processes, because the CSME IP is on a various number of products, all on different processes, and we, and we want to make sure it's as cheap as possible for us to go to different processes. Uh, another reason is that the, CSA, is that the TRC HIP as a, as a digital device is very small, uh, far smaller than analog devices. And so um, while TPMs don't often change their design and don't often change their processes and are on very much older processes, we tend to be changing our process as often as possible and obviously, Intel is trying to be on the state of the art for our CPUs and our chipsets and our graphics devices. So these are some of the reasons why um, we've chosen the TRC over more of a legacy analog device. Now, the challenge, though, is that um, we build a lot of parts, right? Hundreds of millions a year. And for our massively deployed products on scale, we need to make sure that we've calibrated this thing correctly. And we, we believe we have. Now, to prove that, we asked Riskier, uh, who is, if you're not familiar with Riskier, they're a third-party um, third uh, security firm that does, that does fault injection detection testing for products, and we asked them to take the TRC through, uh, through fault injection, and for many, many months, they went and did that, uh, and, and, and they evaluated the TRC for using clock voltage and EMFI, and, as a resu and the result of that was that Happen, we were happy to say that they were not able to, uh, to successfully glitch CSME, and they said that in all, cases, the, in all cases, the glitches were detected by the implemented countermeasures inside uh, the TRC. So, so we got a little bit of, um, uh, so once we did that, we said, oh, maybe we should take this to Black Hat, uh, because until we were 100% sure, we didn't want to go and you know, inform uh, everybody exactly what we had done. Uh, so, anyway, I'm, I'm right at the five-minute mark, um, and so I just want to thank, there are a lot of people who worked on this. Uh, Carlos and I started working on this in 2014, I think, um, and it finally got implemented last year, 
Uh, and again, like I said, there's a lot of people. It's not just us. There's, there's a whole team of people in circuit design, uh, in, uh, in high volume manufacturing, testing, et cetera. And so um, now's a good time for questions. Can you uh, please bring Carlos? Carlos, you're going to get brought up now. So if you guys have any questions, it's a, it's a great time to ask. <laughs> 